I speak all the time about how artificial light exposure at night, especially from things like screens and the television, can have severe impacts on our health, both physical health and mental health. And I want to dive into just a couple of those today to really become clear about how this actually is a threat to your health if you are using screen technology at night um, without doing doing any sort of mitigation, which I'm going to talk about at the end of this video. So I'm going to share my screen, actually, because this is part of a presentation I've given on this topic that I really think helps drive home what are the impacts. So what happens when we see artificial light at night or when we use artificial light at night, especially from screens? What I want you to know first is that when we use artificial light at night, it act, or when we stare at artificial light at night, it actually suppresses the production of a hormone that helps us get to sleep and then repair our bodies when we are asleep. And so if you'll take a look at this, this chart right here, I'm gonna walk you through it. What I want you to see is that um, it, in terms of using different types of lighting technology, such as LEDs that are found in all of our screens, that has the ability to suppress melatonin by 80% or more. If you look at our other forms of lighting, such as compact fluorescent bulbs, they also suppress melatonin quite drastically. So you can imagine the impact of having overhead lights on at night after dark, as well as then staring at screen technologies into the night, and what that's doing to the melatonin production in your brain. It can, it can really drastically suppress it. The reason being is that the blue wavelengths of light that are found, that are really prominent in those types of bulbs, which you can see highlighted in the blue color here, those blue wave wavelengths of light are associated with daytime lighting. Uh, that comes from sunlight, right? The, the blue light, uh, it, look, take a look at the candle. There's very little if, if to no blue light found in candlelight and fire. Those would have been our nocturnal light sources. And when we have a source that emits blue light, that blue light indicates that it's daytime. And so why would the body start to wanna make a lot of melatonin and put us to sleep when it thinks it's daytime? So instead it's going to suppress your melatonin levels and elevate cortisol. And that can have impact on our, both our body's ability to fall asleep, to repair our body when we are asleep, and then drive a lot of hormone imbalances that I'm seeing all the time in clinical practice. And so think about that. How many of you know someone who has a hard time falling asleep, right? Or, you know, or maybe starts to get tired in the evening, but gets this burst of energy, this second wind, and then can't fall asleep before one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Very, very common. And I always encourage people who are experiencing that type of delayed sleep onset to experiment with lowering the lights in their house or in their room um, and putting on blue blockers or making their screens red. So I've got a product recommendations guide at carriebewellness.com slash products that goes into all of the options you have for using orange or red toned blue blockers so that you can still use your screen technology occasionally at night without that big glare of light entering the eyes that suppresses the melatonin. Yeah. So that's one aspect of this, right? We're suppressing melatonin. So let's talk, let's talk then, because we're suppressing melatonin so drastically, not only are we delaying our ability to fall asleep, but melatonin also helps our body to repair when we are asleep. So there's a lot of diseases and conditions now that are linked to blue light exposure, especially at night. So we see there by disrupting melatonin, we can have uh, challenges with our vision. So that's something that we'll see as people use screen technologies longer and longer. And, and e I mean, it's happening younger and younger. Uh, we're seeing things like vision problems, macular degeneration, lots of eye health challenges, cataracts, right? Unfortunately, there's becoming a very, very strong connection between artificial light at night exposure and uh, cancers of the breast, prostate, ovary, and uterus, the hormonal driven cancers. Because melatonin is, again, a primary hormone that's made not only to help us fall asleep, but to help run our repair programs when we are asleep. And we have a certain repair program that we run that actually goes in and sees what cells in our body are dividing uncontrollably, aka cancerous cells, and actually eliminates them from the tissue. We have, we have literally anti-cancer repair programs that require melatonin in order to operate. So what happens if we're staring at this screen and we're not making the melatonin in the first place? And unfortunately, that end result is a drastic increase in breast, prostate, ovarian, and uterine cancers. There's also a big uh, correlation between that artificial light and metabolism challenges, such as increasing the risk for obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. So with obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome, what we now know is that exposure to that blue light into our eyes 
elevates our blood sugar levels. So it's like we're snacking into the evening without actually eating any food. We have a pathway that the body can utilize to literally put sugar into our bloodstream from that blue light. And so um, if we're staring at a screen, it's like, especially into the evening, it's it's akin to just snacking all night long. And that can derange things like um, blood sugar levels to drive things like diabetes and obesity, but also it can very much stimulate hunger cravings as well. Again, the brain thinks it's the middle of the day. In the middle of the day, it thinks it should find and hunt and gather and forage for food. We also see a big time connection between melatonin levels being tanked and incidences of depression, both depression and anxiety. It's a very interesting thing because the blue light can really impair what are called mitochondria inside of our brain. Mitochondria help our brain make energy. And when they become dysfunctional, they can't make adequate energy for the brain. And one of the end results are the symptoms that would be described in depression. This is, a, this is like a, a very, very uh, challenging case though, because the blue light from the screen, we're also designed to be addicted to it. It can really impact our dopamine pathways so that when we don't have that blue light anymore, we start to feel anxiety. Not to mention the fact that we're designed to be on those phones with infinite scroll. We're designed to be on those phones because of the blue light being addictive to the notifications, the ding, 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 who's liking my stuff, who's looking at my stuff. All of that is designed to make us addicted. And so when we remove the source of the addiction, we want it more. So I found, I find one of the best ways to help support this is to make our phone screens red, as red as we can possibly tolerate. And there's ways that you can do that in the iPhones through the accessibility settings, or uh, for an Android phone, you can download an app called the Twilight app. Twilight, it, it makes your phone screens red. Now this looks in really, really red in, in the camera, but it's really uh, easy for me. I've, I've become adjusted to this so I can operate my phone no problem all day long and I can change it and make the red more intense for the evening and dim my screen for the evening. And again, utilize my technology in a smart, safe way that doesn't uh, uh, impact my melatonin levels and drive that anxiety. In addition to that, turn off notifications. Don't let that ding, ding, ding continuously remind you to pick up the phone and look at it. It's a very much a behavioral programming system that's going on there. We also know that blue light um, impairs our ability to clean the brain at night. When we sleep at night, we have a special drainage system in the brain called our glymphatic system. And it's designed to literally drain the brain of its lymphatic fluid at night so that we can have fresh lymphatic fluid in the morning or through, when we wake up. When we can't drain the brain of that lymphatic fluid, that glymphatic fluid, then that means that there's tox excessive toxin and neurotoxin accumulation in the brain itself. And so over time, this can lead to uh, making it harder to learn, it can impair our memory, and it can even drive neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Um, so lots of things going on. I haven't even mentioned things like PCOS, infertility, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but Yes, I, I think I think people are becoming aware that our screen usage may be harmful to health. And what I want you to know is a little bit more details about why. So you can make an informed decision about how you use your cell phone and which ways, ways you might mitigate it using things like a red screen technology or red or orange tone blue blockers in the evening so that you can you can really um, be in the preventative range of these things. You, you're, you know, uh, you're on track to using those phones in a smart way. Now, I'm gonna round this up by saying blue light from the phone is not the only thing that we're concerned with when it comes to human health. There's radiation that comes from the phone. It's called wireless radiation, both from using the cell phone data, the wireless, you know, the wireless signal, as well as the Bluetooth. All of those are forms of wireless radiation. And we now know that wireless radiation has, it's been shown to do a lot of things, but in terms of this discussion, I wanna talk about two aspects. Number one, it's been shown to impair nervous system support. And so the brain, again, is more likely to go towards fight or flight or anxiety. Do you or someone you know have anxiety, this low level chronic anxiety that's always there? We're just not quite sure why and what's causing it. Well, I have found that the, um, mitigating our usage of this, especially the, the fact that it uses wireless radiation, can go a long way towards supporting that. And then it, we also know that it opens the blood brain barrier. So I'm very concerned with utilizing cell phones to the head, as well as wireless um, AirPods and things like that in the ears themselves, because it's been known since the 1960s and 1970s that wireless radiation can open the blood brain barrier. And this has been repeated many, many times in, in um, scientific studies. 
So one of the issues we have there is the blood brain barrier. It exists to prevent toxins from getting into the brain, right? There's a, there's a legitimate barrier there. So what happens when we open the blood brain barrier? We actually allow things that weren't designed to get into the brain to get into that tissue and start to wreak havoc and create some damage. And that will also lead to so many of the things we, we see here from anxiety and depression to memory challenges, Alzheimer's disease. So there's a lot at play here when it comes to cell phone usage. So it's not necessarily about living in a cave and never picking up our cell phones or uh, listening to, to songs or things like that or podcasts or videos or social media. But at the same time, we have to be smart and informed about how we use it. So I especially say put phones on airplane mode or turn them off completely at night when you sleep. Have an alternative source, like a tiny little battery powered alarm clock that you can use to check the time at night if you need it when you wake up in the middle of the night so that this form of wireless radiation is not by your head all night long when you sleep. Um, that can go a long way towards mitigating it. And then secondarily, we gotta go old school with our headphones. We have to get them wired, right? Um, that's the best way to minimize that wireless radiation going directly into the brain. So never holding a cell phone to the side of the head and using speakerphone whenever possible if we need to, and then wearing a wired headphone, uh, wired headphones, which I know might make it more challenging or might look stupid. But at the same time, I find that I want to protect my, my brain health and uh, just my overall health whenever possible, especially with things when I'm talking about here, there's a lot of ramifications for this. So just a little overview. Uh, I could teach a whole college seminar. I actually have on, on um, these types of things when it comes to our health that are really being overlooked. And so I hope this gives you some information so you can make informed choices about how you choose to engage with your cell phone and your wireless devices on a regular basis.